Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Eji. We are so excited to have on the program today, Andrew Boachi, who is a lecturer in religions and theology at the University of Manchester. His field of study is New Testament criticism. So I uh, wanted to just get a chance to go through um, and, and just kind of see if he can just really help us out with New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, the new perspective on Paul. And um, I know we're both part of the same group, uh, which is a Berean ministry. And we kind of had a little bit of an interchange. And I was like, you know, I really need to have him uh, since he's a lecturer and has some expertise to just really break down just the uh, new perspective for us. So again, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's so lovely to be here. That's awesome. By the way, how is the weather over there? <laughs> um, it has started to get sunnier in the last week or so. We normally have a sort of rogue week in spring where it's really warm. I think this is it. It's not particularly warm, but it's very sunny. So okay. um, it's made a nice change. At least it, it, it feels nicer. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not actually much warmer, but there you go. So it's good weather for tea? For tea? Oh, this is this is England. There's no such thing as bad weather for tea. There's <laughs> always time for tea. I have right, a cup right, right here. Uh, not looking around. That's good. That's good. All right. So our first question as we start out is, can you just uh, help us understand what the new perspective on Paul is, uh, what it is and what it's seeking to accomplish? Yeah, so the new perspective on Paul, I would say, is um, a cluster of ideas. Um, a new way of thinking about key Pauline texts, and in particular, I'd say Romans and Galatians, although I'd say it would certainly affect some parts of Philippians and Second Corinthians as well. Um, and if I were to try to sort of sum it up, I would say it's an attempt to, to rethink the what has become the very predominant hermeneutic for Paul, which was largely based on the thinking of the reformers, most notably Martin Luther, but certainly uh, people like Zwing, uh, Zwingli and Calvin as well. Um, but it, it, it embraces a whole bunch of other ideas, including how we reconstruct ancient Judaism. Mm -hmm. and one of the key criticisms raised by the new perspective is how Luther attempted to reconstruct ancient Judaism, basically using Paul's letters, which of course are argumentative polemical texts and so um, trying to sort of base our understanding of Judaism on Paul's letters themselves is, is an error and I'd say that's one of the that's one of the findings which I think most people would embrace even people who are not um, proponents of the new perspective or people who even dismiss many of the other ideas but it also uh, involves key ideas of uh, Christology how um, Paul understands what it is Jesus came to do mm. um, and key areas of what's called soteriology, um, the, the study of salvation, uh, the, the, the key uh, sort of salvation terminology that's used in Romans and Galatians is this notion of justification by faith. Well, the question is, well, well, well what is that and what is it intended to achieve? Um, and Luther had some key ideas uh, about what these terms means, uh, meant terms like justification by faith, terms like works of the law, terms like faith in Christ. Um, and the new perspective on Paul is an attempt to, to, to rethink some of these ideas and suggest places where there might be uh, flaws in the uh, sort of the thinking of the reformers uh, and suggest where there might be uh, gaps in our broader understanding of what it was that Paul was aiming to do uh, in, his, in, his, in his texts. Okay. So if I understand, I think part of it um, had to do also with the fact that uh, the Reformation basically looked at Paul and looked at the works that were noted in, uh, I'm guessing in, in Galatians and some other passages and basically said, you know, works are a bad thing. And they basically took, for example, the, um, uh, and you have to help me out here. They basically superimposed all the works that are noted instead of just distinguishing, you know, circumcision, food laws, and these kinds of things. 
and looked at those works as separate than all the works that were noted. And basically, as you said, made it just an issue about, you know, faith alone and works are bad. It was kind of like the Reformation. And basically, the, the new perspective kind of basically came back and said, no, works are not a bad thing. So I'm kind of getting it a little bit. Can you maybe yeah. untangle my verbiage a little? Yeah, there, there is some there is some element of that. One of one of the I think it helps to understand where Martin Luther was coming from and the other reformers. And I think it's 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 important to note that what they were doing was reacting to years of medieval interpretations. Correct. Of all, um, many of which placed um, in their mind, justification was simply the beginning of an ongoing process which required you to do lots and lots of good things. So justification wasn't something that, that happened when you had faith in Christ and, and now was kind of all embracing. It was the beginning of a process in medieval thinking. Um, and so you were constantly having to, 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 to perform works which were commensurate with justification. And I think what Luther was trying to say is that, that there is no way you can earn your salvation. Um, there's, there, there are no works of any kind which can be involved in the salvation question. And Luther, who was heavily influenced by St. Augustine, um, was, was, was trying to say that um, the, the entire initiative came from God. We are sinners. We are, you know, uh, hopeless in many ways in the eyes of God. Uh, and the only way that that can be reconciled is by some kind of divine initiative. Um, now, Augustine was very different. Augustine was a philanderer and a worldly person who, who you know, had his, his awakening. Um, Luther was a pious monk, but was, was in many ways very guilt-laden by his yeah. own sin and by his own, um, you know, his own sort of attempts to live the right kind of life. Many people accused Luther, and I, and I think there is some truth to this, of, of reading his own struggles and his own battles with the Catholic hierarchy into Galatians. So right. effectively, the sort of Paul's opponents in Galatians almost represented Catholic hierarchy, um, yeah. and Paul's converts represented sort of Reformationist thinking. So in that sense, yes, um, I don't, I think it's probably a little bit simplistic to say that it sort of works good, it works good in the new perspective and works bad in the older perspective or the, or the Lutheran perspective. Um, but rather that what Luther sought to do was to almost remove works from the salvation equation altogether. Right. So, for, so for Luther, the works of the law were the entirety of the commands, uh, mainly in the Torah. Um, now, I, I personally don't think he was wrong about that, but I do agree with the specificities introduced by people like James Dunn, who argued that the works of the law um, were those things which separated Jew from Gentile, things that had sort of very nationalistic um, exceptionality, things like kosher law, Sabbath observance, circumcision. Um, you know, even for those people who think the works of the law do point to all the things commanded in the law, certainly the things that Paul was reacting to in Galatians are those three things. They are the three things which come up. Circumcision is clearly the key issue, but he does um, make mention of uh, Sabbath observance in, in Galatians 4. Um, and of course, the, the big debacle in Antioch in Galatians 2, 11 through 14 is all about food. So clearly those are the things which are uh, most pertinent to the interpretation of Galatians. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to just get a better understanding, if you can help us out with also, is some of the key figures and some of the key dates in the new perspective. Yeah. Now, I know, I think uh, you and I talked a little bit earlier, there really isn't one new perspective. There's a whole bunch of uh, different thought processes and, and individuals and so forth. But can you give us just a little bit of an outline of the individuals and dates? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I mean, we can probably go back to the patristics for um, the time when people were first starting to question um, what what certain phrases mean, what fra certain phrases mean in the, in the uh, Pauline corpus. Um, but I think in terms of the, the new perspective as it's influenced the study of Paul, certainly in the last 60 or 70 years, 
Um, I'd say probably from the turn of the 20th century, a very early part of the 20th century, um, people like uh, Claude Montefiore and George Foot Cross, uh, George Foot Moore rather, um, um, were already starting to reject the idea that Paul was ignorant of the atonement rituals that you and the atonement theology that you got in the rabbinic literature, in Jewish literature. So, so there were already people saying that, that Paul's view of atonement theology was very Jewish. I'd say that the first major turn came in 1963 with a, a Lutheran bishop, funnily enough, he was a Lutheran himself, uh, called Christa Stondahl. Um, now, Christa Stondahl wrote a very important paper called Paul and the Introspective Conscience of the West. Um, and he was arguing against Luther's for, view. For small, for small powder keg, huh? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was, I mean, I think it had reports even beyond the field of theology, um, because um, even from a sort of psychological perspective, he was arguing this idea of a, of a guilt-ridden conscience was a, was a very modern and very Western idea. But to a first century Jew um, a, 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 like Paul, um, th this kind of idea of a guilt-racked conscience was, was it, it simply didn't emerge from the Pauline texts, and, and that for many ancients these, these were quite alien ideas um so he took the passages in philippians 3 where paul describes himself as a, a hebrew of hebrews and of the tribe of benjamin and circumcised on the eighth day this is clearly someone with a very robust conscience this was someone who was very proud of his jewish pedigree this is not someone mm -hmm. who was you know this this uh desperately introspective sinner who was just trying to find a gracious god these were luther's questions and part mm -hmm. of what the perspective of Paul is attempting to do is saying, well, were Luther's questions really Paul's questions? Um, and to some degree, they, they were. But in the initial instance, they, they really weren't. Um, but I'd say the, the keg really went off in 1977 with the publication of a book called Paul and Palestinian Judaism by a chap called E.P. Sanders, Edward Parrish Sanders. Um, now, what Sanders did was to thoroughly critique Luther's attempt to recreate ancient Judaism using Paul's texts. And he said, no, what you, if you want to recreate ancient Judaism, you have to use the rabbinic literature and actual Jewish texts. And that's really what the, the book was aimed at doing. I, I think the book should have been called Palestinian Judaism and Paul, because really it was about rethinking Palestinian Judaism. But he then tried to sort of say, well, what does this mean for uh, Pauline theology? And what, what, what Sanders effectively concluded was that Jews understood grace perfectly well. They knew full well that you didn't have to earn your way into God's favour. And this idea of Judaism as a, the technical term is soteriological meritocracy. The, the layperson's term is religion of works righteousness was completely alien to Judaism. Um, and that actually they understood grace reasonably well. But then of course that then threw open the, the, the obvious question was that, well, well, what did Paul think that Jesus came to do then? If he didn't come to sort of rescue us from this idea of earning your salvation by your works and that he wasn't introducing this idea of grace, well then what was he doing? And Sanders very sort of sarcastically said in his book that, Paul's only problem with Judaism is that it wasn't Christianity. Now, he argued that what Paul did was argue from solution to plight. He said that Paul, having had this experience with Jesus on the, on the Damascus Road, had to now go back into, into his uh, Jewish history and his Jewish thinking and effectively find a problem for Jesus to be the solution to. So Paul wasn't someone who was aware of a plight, aware of a problem, and then had this experience and thought, aha, Jesus is the solution. That the ultimate, that really Paul had no problem with Judaism. He had no problem with the law, but having had this experience with Jesus, he now had to find a problem for Jesus to solve. Uh, and so he turned to the law and, and, and found uh, various concerns with it. So this was Sanders kind of light bulb moment. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for most people, I mean, very few people accepted all of Sanders' conclusions, very few. 
Um, most people accepted that he was basically right in his critique of Luther and Luther's attempt to recreate ancient Judaism. Um, very few people believe that Paul is arguing from uh, solution to plight. Most people think that Paul's ruminations led him to think that there were uh, places where Judaism um, was, was not providing the answers for forming a worldwide family of God, at least not, not one that involved Jews and Gentiles on an equal footing. And I would argue that this was something which was uh, very central to, to Paul's thinking. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, uh, and also I don't think most people would have accepted, um, uh, some people were very critical of, of the, the Jewish sources that Sanders selected to draw his conclusions, because that the, the truth is there are some Jewish texts which do suggest that you have to earn your salvation. That, there, that there's, there's certainly certain Jewish texts which do suggest that, and he seemed to carefully sideline those. Um, but I think the, the broad his broad conclusion is correct. The Jews do understand grace. For the for for most ancient Jewish groups, grace was how you came into the covenant. Obeying the law was how you remained in the covenant. And this was what Sanders concluded. And he, he referred to, he called this covenantal gnomism. This is the idea that you enter the covenant by grace, but once you're in a covenant relationship with God, you obey the Torah as, as a way of staying in the covenant. That's how life in the covenant um, exists. It exists by, by, by following the Torah. So as I say, many people took up Sanders ideas. I say, um in in a, in a sort of um in terms of much more modern writers um, we've talked about james dunn I, I say james dunn is the person who um he he would argue that sanders didn't go far enough in the idea of of uh, of, of paul as a covenantal thinker okay. um and so for for dunn um the idea of of a of a new covenant very much had to it had to break ethnic boundaries and that this was Paul's key idea. And so when he said that you, you can't be justified by observing the works of the law, what he meant was you can't be justified by um, observing those elements of the law which keep, you, which keep Jews separate from Gentiles. So for Dunn, the works of the law were specifically things like kashrut, you know, the Jewish food and dietary laws, um, observing the Sabbath, which was, you know, became a sort of litmus test for authentic Judaism, and circumcision, which was also a sort of a litmus test, certainly in the um, sort of couple of hundred years before Jesus, um, right up to a couple of hundred years after Jesus, and um, was also a litmus test for the authenticity of, uh, of, of Judaism. And there are other thinkers, uh, people like Tom Wright, uh, Terence Donaldson, Doug Campbell, uh, many who have embraced these ideas, although they've... they've what about gone... Barclay, John Barclay? John Barclay, um, who I have met a few times and have had exchanges with, um, is, for me, one of the finest Pauline scholars ever. Uh, and his, his, one of his key, well, there are two major contributions I'd say he's made. I mean, there are several contributions he's made just to New Testament studies and, and biblical studies in general. But in study of Paul, his 1988 book, um, Obeying the Truth, um, I think helped us understand that the last two chapters of Galatians shouldn't just be seen as a sort of, um, well, I've done all the theology and now here are the practicals. This is how sometimes Galatians is divided up. But actually Galatians five and six are very central to the broader argument. Um, in, in most recent days, I say his key contribution um, is in the understanding of the notion of grace in, in Pauline studies, um, and particularly grace in terms of gift. And he wrote a, a couple of wonderful books, one much more sort of heavy going technical book called Paul and the Gift. Um, but he's done a, a sort of much, much more condensed version of it called Paul and the Power of Grace. And I would recommend both of those books to anyone interested in, in the ideas. Okay, thank you.
So uh, speaking of Galatians, um, actually, we'll combine Romans in there, too. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you think a, a, a more accurate understanding of both Romans and Galatians can impact our view of grace and works? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is I'll, I'll try and. Try to try to break it down to the easy level for us. Yeah, well, but when I, I think it's such a, a broad issue that it's it's difficult yeah. to know which bits to, to come from. I think that the, the first thing is to, is that no no perspective can can encapsulate this. That um, one thing I think the new perspective has, has, has at least helped us understand is that it, it's not a completely simplistic idea. Um, I think. Um, the, the, the second thing kind of associated with that is that you have this kind of almost contrast between what James says about work, works, and what Paul says, and people treat these things as if they're in, in conflict, but they're really not. What, what James is saying is that authentic trust in Jesus should be manifest in a particular kind of lifestyle, and I don't think anyone would disagree with that. What Paul is talking about is... Um, what someone has to do in order to be justified in the first place um, and that you can't be justified simply by um, observing um, the works of the Torah whatever you think the works of the Torah are whether you think they are you know sort of centralized to things like circumcision and, and kosher law or whether you think that involves the entire gamut of the 613 dictates that there are in, in, the, in the Jewish Torah um, so these two things aren't necessarily in conflict. Um, and again, in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, it says that, you know, we're, we're saved by grace for the purpose of doing good works. So grace and works in many ways, I think, go hand in hand. I, I'd say the most, the, the thing which has impacted me the most, and I, I'd, I'd say, as I say, was the most, um, uh, I think, important contribution, one of the most important recent contributions of John Barclay, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is, um, is understanding how Paul's view of grace was so utterly radical when compared to the views of grace in the ancient world. Now, most ancient thinkers would agree that, and of course, for many ancient thinkers, they believed in a multiplicity of God. They didn't just believe in one God. They would say that um, the gods um, were very generous in their gifts to humankind. Um, they would even agree with Paul that um, the gods gave um, as a matter of priority. So they gave before human beings did, did, any, did anything um, back, did anything to, 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 um, to warrant the gift. Um, that's not, you know, obviously there are exceptions to, to, to those two rules, but the, the key idea that, that, um, that Barclay introduces, and I, I think he's absolutely right, um, is that Paul's understanding of, of grace and of gift um, is that God gave indiscriminately, and this was completely um, counter to anything that you find in the ancient in ancient Greek or Roman literature. Um, in fact, what, what Barclay unpacks is what he calls the social function of grace. And remember, for, for grace, as we understand it, obviously grace is, is a, a, a term which is quite um, loaded with sort of religious baggage, as it were. But the, the Greek term just means gift, just like you'd give any gift, like you'd give a gift on someone's birthday. There's no it has no particular religious understanding. It's simply to do with the notion of, of giving. And what Paul argues is that God gave the ultimate gift, the most precious and prized gift, his son Jesus, with, with no terms and conditions about the worthiness of the recipient. And this, because in, in the ancient world, the social function of gift giving was about the establishment of community. It was about the establishment of social relations. So it, it was very important who you gave the gift to. Mm 
who you gave a gift to said something about the importance of the person that you're giving to. It said something about the social relations and networks that you were establishing. Um, so it was actually, and, and you find this sometimes even in the works of ancient authors, particularly um, Cicero and others, um, that, that, that to give gifts to the wrong kinds of people was very bad for society. So even the gods were you know, perceived to be very discriminating in how they gave gifts. They gave generously, but they gave to the right people. But now you have Paul establishing these communities where you had people of different social class, you had both men and women, you had different ethnic groups. And he's saying that actually God has given this ultimate gift of Jesus to everyone and anyone without any concern about the worthiness of the recipient. And, and, and so you have these, 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 these new social relations where it didn't matter who you were. So take the, the book of Philemon, which would have been considered explosive in the ancient world. Here you have Paul saying uh, to um, his friend Philemon, I want you to take Onesimus, this slave, and I want you to treat him like a brother. How, how that that couldn't that would make no sense in 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 most ancient thinking, but this was the depth of the grace of, of divine grace. Paul was saying that um, God didn't think about the worthiness of the recipient. He already knows all recipients are unworthy, in fact, but gave the ultimate gift. Um, you know, think about how we are today. When it's Christmas time, we don't just go on the streets and randomly start handing out presents to strangers we give presents to our nearest and dearest, the people that we love. When we, when, when we write a will, we don't leave money to people that we dislike or leave money to just any old body. We, we, we bequeath money and gifts and estates and property and whatever to our nearest and dearest, to our, our loved ones, our relatives. Um, so we all think about giving very discriminately. But Paul saying that when it came to the giving of the ultimate gift, God didn't think in discriminatory fashion. He said, this gift is open to everyone. And this broke down all kinds of social barriers in the ancient world and would have made the ancient Christian movement look fairly strange, I think. People would have sat up and taken notice and thought, what kind of a community is this where a slave owner and a slave consider each other equals and it can be can be brothers it just it just didn't it wouldn't have computed for many so, so in terms of how it affects our understanding of grace i think the key thing i think um is to understand the the, the radical nature of grace um and uh the the degree to which um it, it, it upsets our, our our traditional ideas of social relations mm -hmm. Yeah, I think another aspect for me, uh, as I see it, um, I know Barclay has, I think, the six different elements of grace, which I, I can't remember all of them right now, but I think one of them was that it's a reciprocal. So in other words, when someone gives something to someone, there is a reciprocal and you return that favor with whatever. Um, so in this case, you know, God gives us, um, you know, his son, Jesus, he gives us salvation. And we reciprocate that with a life lived uh, in righteousness to him. So I guess for me, I think that's one of the big aspects of grace that I saw. I think what you're highlighting is huge, obviously. But I think for me, just the theological understanding that, you know, grace isn't just this unmerited favor where there isn't anything that's expected of the receiver. But like in ancient times, that was the expectation. It was like the thing to do. And that was understood, you know, even in Jesus's day. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, a few people have discussed this. Barclay does. And I know the six elements of, of grace you're talking about, the priority of grace, the, the abundance of grace, or they're all, they're all very useful categories. Um, Barclay is drawing upon the ancient notion of, um, uh, benefaction okay um, which is uh the notion of um uh, uh it's called uh, patronage patronage um 
Um, now, a, a patron was someone who would, um, he would provide some kind of support for you mm -hmm. um, in return for um, some kind of, um, well, a, a return of the favour in a sense. So mm -hmm. a patron would usually be someone who gave money. That's normally what a patron would be required to do or provide lodgings or provide some kind of um, uh, sort of starter energy for some projects that you're about to embark on. And you, the client, so in a patronage, you have patron and client. The, what the client would do is return the favour by, um, so for example, if the patron needed votes in some kind of election, the client would encourage his networks to vote for his patron. And that would be the return. So it would be something that you could do that didn't require you know, the repayment of actual money or, the, or giving the thing back in some way. There was no monetary value, but you could somehow return the favor in a way that would, would help the, your, your, your client, your, your patron's life in some way. Um, and I think it helps to see God's giving sometimes in terms of the sort of patron client relationship. So we are in, in some degree, to some degree, in patient client relationship to God. Now, we're, th there is no way we can pay God back. Sure. There's nothing that we can do to, to sort of, to, to satisfy the debt, as it were. There's, there's no amount of anything that we could give. Right. Um, but as clients of a divine benefactor, um, we ought to, you know, our lives ought to change in such a way as to reflect the nature of the gift that's been given. So in 1 Corinthians 15, when, when Paul says, for example, that um, he worked harder than all of the apostles, but not them, but what rather the grace that worked in me, this is what he means. It's that as, as, as he understands himself to be the client of a divine patron, that he's got some understanding of this debt that he'll never pay back. And that this is the energy that drives him towards a particular kind of life. And I think this is the most theologically sound way of understanding grace because I think it can go off in, in some areas which lead to, to some not so good conclusions. Sure. It, so we shouldn't think of it in terms of paying God back. We shouldn't think of it in terms of doing something kind of, I don't even think it's necessarily helpful to say that you're doing it as a way of saying thank you, because even that I don't think fully captures it. But rather, I think it's understanding that um, once you have a sense of uh, the, the, the magnitude of what's been given to you, that that becomes the drive for a particular kind of life. And it is a life of, of righteousness and of service. We don't do these things to pay God back. It's not unhelpful to think of it in a way of saying thank you, but, you know, we say thank you, you know, for all sorts of things. Some, someone gives you anything, you say thank you. We're not really just saying thank you. We're doing much more than that. We're we're being empowered by grace for a particular way of uh, of living. Yeah, I think for me, honestly, that was revolutionary when I learned a little bit about that from you know Matt, Matthew Bates and I think uh, just some outlines of some of the stuff that you mentioned from Barclay. Um, so no, thank you for that. So as we go ahead and wrap it up, I know you've written a couple of books. I think you've co-authored one and written another. Can you share a little bit about those books very uh, briefly as we wrap it up? Sure, yeah. My um, my interest um, uh, was, was really sparked in, in the book of Galatians. Um, I was interested in the notion of uh, ancient Christian identity construction. So, so what, what does it mean when someone identified as a Christian? What were they actually trying to say? Um, and... I was more interested in how theological ideas shaped the identity. And, and the one which stood out for me the most was resurrection. But then I became um, sort of concerned, stroke alarmed, when I realized that the first place where, where Paul really addressed this notion of um, uh, 
being in Christ and being in relationship with Christ and what that meant um, was in a letter which hardly ever mentions the resurrection. Galatians is mentioned once, uh, sorry, the resurrection is mentioned once in Galatians in the opening line of the letter. And even then it's as a divine title. It describes God as the one having raised Jesus from the dead. But then he's not, the resurrection is not mentioned again there. And the scholarship generally said that that's because Paul didn't have a serious dispute about resurrection with his opponents in Galatia. Um, and that Paul was sort of reacting to his opponents and this sort of thing, which I, I never thought was a satisfactory answer. Um, and so I, I started exploring ideas of resurrection imagery in Galatians. And what I noticed was although the resurrection itself isn't mentioned explicitly, Paul does use an awful lot of what I call resurrection or more technically revivification imagery throughout Galatians. So case in point, Galatians 2, 19 through 20, Paul says, um, through the law, I died to the law in order that I might live to God. I've been co-crucified with Christ and that which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who um, loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul says that he died in order to live. And he actually says that, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And that which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So Paul in some sense says he's dead, he, he no longer lives, but then goes to talk on about the life that he now lives. And so you sort of think, well, which is it, Paul? Are you alive or dead? And, and it's that central phrase, Christ lives in me. So he's alive in a new kind of way because of he's, he's conscious of this, this, this reanimating energy, which he calls the life of Christ. And then you see it, you know, I then started to see it kind of all over the place. So um, in Galatians 3.21, where Paul is describing the limitations of the law, he says it's because it's it, its inability to make alive. Galatians 5, 24 through 25, and he's talking about um, how the Gentiles came into um, into Christ, he says that they um, that they they crucified the flesh um, with its lust and desires, and now they live because they live by spirit. They ought to keep in step with the spirit. So again, this idea of crucifixion and life, and then in um, six verse eight, um, you know, he talks about how you um, if you if you sow to the spirit, you will reap. Um, from the spirit and if you sow to the flesh you reap from the flesh and then in Galatians 6 14 through 15 he says even the cosmos has been crucified and now circumcision and uncircumcision are nothing but only a new creation so even the cosmos has been crucified and has read Romans 8 as a new creation is that again, again, tie yes. into Romans 8 okay wow it, it very strongly ties into Romans 8 very strong seems like Galatians is a little brother to Romans it, it very much is now the relationship well but you've, <laughs> you've actually just uncovered what i'm working on currently um one of my current research interests is in the what i wrote my master's dissertation on actually is on um how uh, jewish groups understood and received the figure of abraham and paul uses abraham in his arguments in galatians 3 and 4 and again in romans 4 and most of the scholarship treat these as very two as two very separate arguments um what i've suggested in a paper i did recently at the university of edinburgh is that um actually these arguments are not just complementary but they're, they're almost the same argument and the, the the key issue that's tying them together is is resurrection and new life um but i, I won't bore you with the details of all that now can we can we see your books i happen to have them right here um so this is my published doctoral dissertation it's entitled death and life okay uh, resurrection restoration and rectification in paul's letter to the galatians galatians okay um and actually my new book which was co-authored with my former supervisor uh, peter oaks is entitled rethinking galatians paul's vision of oneness in the living christ so myself and my former supervisor um peter oaks he he wrote a, a galatians commentary in the paideia series uh, and uh, because we've both written on Galatians relatively recently, we thought it'd be good to kind of pool our ideas and kind of provide a, a new way of, uh, of uh, thinking through some of the ideas in Galatians. Uh, so yeah, after sort of, uh, nearly two years, this was the, uh, this was the, uh, the output. That's awesome, that's awesome. Well, I, I definitely appreciate your time.
uh, trying to untangle a few of my thoughts and trying to uh, clarify just, uh, you know, the new perspective on Paul. So this definitely is very, very helpful. So uh, we're not going to take too much of your time. I know it's uh, late, that side of the pond. Yes. But, <laughs> but again, uh, thanks so much. I do want to just uh, say to those watching, if you enjoy this episode, please click like and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks again. Thanks so much.